compared to the man with a satisfied mind. All right. Hello, YouTube. All right, I gotta pull up. Where's the video? Where's your comments? I think I'm live. I clicked it a while ago. Hey, what's up, everybody? Okay. Wow. We got a bunch of people. Hey, everybody. Okay, Ariana's deciding to. What can you guys see? I gotta pull up. What are you doing, Ariana? I'm. You're skateboarding in the house? No. I'm going to get Bert. You're gonna go get Bert? Yeah. Wow, I didn't even... Ariana's pr apparently pregnant and is going to give birth. Oh, uh, here's her husband. That's your husband? Yes. He's small. No, he's just a baby. He's just a baby? Yeah, it's a little loud. Um, okay, cool. She married a baby, and she's pregnant with a baby. What's up, everybody? Okay, where is... I got to organize my desktop here, people. I see myself, which is kind of annoying. I like to hide that part and pull up the chat. Where's the chat? There it is. Okay, I got to do a pop up chat window. Oh, it's time wasted. All right. Jason, Brian, Kathleen in Texas. We've got Switzerland, London, Amsterdam. This is insane. Can you guys hear? Y'all can hear, right? Six Retro Six says no sound or only me. I'm pretty sure I got a mic. My, my camera's connected to the mic. All right, you guys can hear. What's up, everybody? Carrie S. Hello. Jonathan Payne, what's up? All right, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Crazy. We got people from all over. Alexander, what's up? Adobe Gaines Prapa. How was everybody's weekend? I hope your weekend was well. It's Monday. It's a Monday afternoon. So I'm about to start this hangout. I go downstairs to get some nice cold water. I love this copper cup. It needs to get it needs to get buffed out. It's starting to look I love this cup though. Feels so cold in your hands. I like metal cups, especially copper. Um, anyways, I went to get some cold water and I walk in the kitchen and it smells incredible. It smelled so good in there. It, had, it was, I don't even know how to explain it. It just smelled like delicious Mexican food or something. I don't know. And I look over and Jessica's got a huge, um, she, she's got food all over the stove and it looks delicious. And it made me really hungry. She says it's a low carb chili. I'm not sure what's in it. It smells like meat and like there might be some kind of a yogurt thing involved and perhaps some roasted garlic. I, I don't know. I don't know what's going on there, but it smelled so good. It made me really, really hungry. All right. Mike Mo Lawasani in San Francisco. Jennifer, hello. Okay, here we go. Let's answer some questions here. Jason says, dude, I've been doing keto for three weeks. And I only lost water weight. My muscles are tighter, though. Should I cook everything 19th butter? All right, so we got some typos going on there with butter, not 19th. <laughs> Auto, you got autocorrected to 19th instead of with. Uh, all right, here. There's so much. Are you trolling me with this comment? Come on, man. He said, do have been doing keto for three weeks and have only lost water weight. Okay, so the first part of that sentence, the reason I ask... If you're trolling, is you're saying, should I cook everything with butter? Like that's somehow going to make you lose body fat. I don't know. Think about it. Where did you hear that cooking things with butter, adding more butter, will somehow make you lose more body fat is my first question. But also the second question is you've been doing keto for three weeks, right? And you say you only lost water weight and your muscles feel tighter. So your body feels tighter. I guess what you're talking about is your skin feels more tight on your more dense, less squishy. Um, how do you know you only lost water weight? That's my first question. You have no idea that you only lost water weight. You're assuming you only lost water weight. You're telling yourself that you know you only lost water weight, but where's the evidence for this in your life? There's probably significant fat being lost. 
you're not going to feel or necessarily see on the scale everything that's happening in your body all the time. So you have to understand how to measure your progress. And to understand how to measure your progress is simple. You basically you need to pick which metrics are important to you. So are you going for fat loss? You say you've been doing keto for three weeks and have only lost water weight. That's what I'm assuming from the question there um, or from the statement there is that you're going for fat loss. So in the context of fat loss, your goal is to burn body fat. In order to burn body fat, you have to create an energy deficit so where you will burn your own body fat. In no way, shape, or form is adding more fat to the diet helping us to create the deficit that we need to, to burn more body fat, right? So eating more fat, the common misconception that to do a ketogenic diet right, to do keto correctly, to lose body fat, that we need to eat loads of fat. This comes from the fact that when you're adapting to keto in the beginning, you really don't want to create this massive deficit, right? So it's kind of better to eat more fats in the beginning. That doesn't mean you're eating – eat more fat doesn't mean eat as much fat as you can eat. It doesn't mean you have to add butter to everything that you put in your mouth. That's not what it means. That's kind of the extreme visual version that you get from marketing on the internet and stuff like that, right? But that's not reflecting reality. The magic of keto is not that, it me that you eat as much fat as you can – um, and the more fat you eat, the less body fat you're going to have. That's not what happens. Um, all right. My son's crying in the other room. My primal instincts run in there and see what's going on, but I think he's fine. So you want to burn body fat. Keto allows you to burn body fat because keto torches hunger. Ketones lower your hunger. When you're in kind of a starvation state, ketones are there as an alternate fuel source to carbohydrate. Not just for starvation. I guess that's that's kind of a loaded statement to say because I don't believe that keto is only there for when you're starving. I think this is a mechanism that we tap into regularly, seasonally, throughout our lives, throughout the history of mankind and anthropology and the history of humanity and civilization. We've used ketosis seasonally when carbohydrates are not available, right? When it's cold, you got harsh winters, we need to be able to burn body fat efficiently. Also, just so we don't have to eat all the time, right? ketones are there gluconeogenesis in your liver is a beneficial thing that allows you in between meals to not have to have a constant glucose drip it allows us to regulate the homeostasis of our body and our blood sugar levels consistently so these are mechanisms that are there to help us survive right so a ketogenic diet torches hunger when you're in the state of needing to seek food right like when you're low on food low on fuel, when it's been two or three days without food, you don't want to be in a highly excitable state wasting energy. Ketosis allows us to conserve energy. It puts us in a very mellow mind state. I guess mellow is kind of a strong term for it, but it, it puts us in a neurological state. It creates a state where your body will run more off of and your brain will create more GABA rather than more excitatory neurotransmitters like glutamate. GABA is calming and soothing. So we're in this calming, soothing state when we need to be because you don't want to be stressing out, wasting a bunch of energy when you need to be searching for food when you're in a harsh environment, right? Um, there's many different things when you think about ketosis, when you yoke it to environmental, seasonal, and circadian rhythm conditions in the human um, you know, condition historically, it makes a lot of sense. But what doesn't make sense to me is why people are saying online or people – tend to believe yeah. what other people say online and this crazy marketing, this extreme hyperbolic, hyperbolic marketing of, uh, you know, eat more fat, lose more weight. You've got to eat more fat. You need more fat. That's not true. All right. So no, you shouldn't just add butter to everything because you think you're not losing weight. You're probably losing body fat. You say it's just water weight, but you don't know that you're just saying that you're probably losing body fat. It's probably not happening as quickly as you think it is, as you think it should which you need to also check your, uh, your expectations, right? But if you do, let me get back to actually tracking progress. To track your progress, you got to pick things to measure. So I suggest waste measurements, meaning you actually wet measure your waist. Um, if your clothes start fitting looser, but the scale hasn't shown that you've lost weight, that doesn't mean that you haven't lost body fat. In a lot of cases, people are losing body fat. Good camera. Uh, People are losing body fat and gaining lean muscle tissue. So when you're gaining lean muscle mass and losing body fat at the same time, sometimes the scale is not moving. 
but you're looking in the mirror and suddenly you've got like veins popping out that weren't there before. You've got muscular definition that you didn't have before, but the scale doesn't give you what you want. Right. You know, the scale is still useful. It's just not always telling you the truth. And sometimes it's a straight up liar about what's going on, especially for females. There's a lot of water fluctuation throughout the month. I mean, even men, if you're stressed out, if you're not getting proper sleep, you can be holding more water weight. These fluctuations happen. So you got to pick a metric other than just like, I'm going to look at the scale. And I'm going to assume this is all water weight. You got to pick different met metrics. So learning how to use calipers can be beneficial, although it's not perfect. It's um, it's only as perfect as a person using the tool, right? So learning how to use calipers properly, that can be helpful. Also, looking at the scale, but using waist measurements, how your clothes fit, and visual estimations, meaning you take a photograph, same lighting conditions, same angle, same time of day, and you gauge progress through that visual of you know, visual medium. So there's many different ways you can do it. You can pick several of those, but you can't just track progress by looking at the scale. And then three weeks later, you look totally different in the mirror. You look at the scale and you've lost whatever, five pounds. And then you say, it's just water weight, right? I mean, that's like failure mentality there, right? You're doing well. Your body is changing. Roll with it. Enjoy it. Refine what you're doing. Get better in of habits that will maintain that you know, the fat loss that you want and the body composition that you're looking for, if that's the carrot on the end of your stick, right? Different people do things, different people change their diet for different reasons. Some people just want to live a healthier, more vibrant, connected life. Some people aren't even doing keto for fat loss. Some people are just sick of treating their body poorly and stuffing garbage down it, treating it like a toxic waste industrial garbage disposal with the toxic waste industrial diet that we've been spoon fed through culture, right? I mean, there's different reasons people do this. So thank you for the question, Jason. Don't worry that it's not just water weight and don't, don't talk yourself out of potential progress, right? You're probably making a bunch of progress. You're just tripping out on this water weight thing and you're fixating on it. Don't fixate. Scraparella in Las Vegas. Scraparella. Great name. All right. Got people in Amsterdam, Switzerland. Jonathan Payne is calling out Johnny Cash over in London. All right. Adobe Gaines says, when trying to fit full day of protein in two meals, which is about for him, he says 130 grams. He says 260 gram meals. That's 120 grams. Adobe Gaines, check your arithmetic there, bud. All right. So you're trying to get 60 grams in for a meal. You ask if the slight insulin spikes, negligible as long as carbs remain below 20 to 30 grams. Fantastic question. That's a great question, right? And there's a lot of different ways I can tackle this. Um, there's a lot of assumptions built into the question, which I always like to go for first, and then, then we'll go from there. All right, so trying to hit a full day of protein, two meals. Say you're trying to get 120 on protein. You know, I mean, for me, 120 grams, that's enough protein for me. Um, that's a, probably about 0.8 grams per pound of my lean body mass. That's about similar to what I do on average, right? Sometimes I'm more, sometimes I'm less, depending on goals, how I feel, and what the heck's going on, how strictly I'm going to track my diet, which at this point, I don't track anything on the average day, right? The habits are there. It's rolling. You know, I'm not having to tune it and calibrate it all the time. It just goes. The habits are built in. It's part of my lifestyle. I eat healthy foods. I fuel my machine. I fuel the body, you know, this is, this is a vessel to fuel me so that I can get things done in this world that are meaningful to me, right? And the diet is meaningful in that context, right? The meaning, the context of it is very important. So I don't know what your context is, but you're saying, you're asking if the slight insulin spikes are negligible. So there's an assumption that slight insulin spikes are undesirable built in there, right? There's the assumption. I disagree with that assumption. And I would say that you must question that assumption. Why is a slight spike in insulin like from protein and vegetables? Why is that not desired? Our bodies are highly intelligent vessels. They're highly intelligent machines. There are systems within systems within systems, regulating systems within systems within systems 
all keeping this delicate balance that's a, that allows us to live, to walk around, to move, to breathe, to poop, to pee, to procreate, to maybe thrive. You know, I got all the animal level stuff there. And then you've got meaningful life floating above that. <laughs> um, so the body's very intelligent. Insulin is not bad. Carbohydrates are not bad. You need insulin for protein, right? Insulin will be released when you eat protein. Glucagon is also very important. Glucagon actually releases and liberates glucose into the bloodstream. These processes are tightly regulated. When people become insulin resistant, when there's loads of insulin present all the time and it's not doing its job, the cells become resistant to it, we get loads of problems. Just because insulin resistance exists doesn't mean insulin is bad. Okay? So there's one thing. Insulin's not bad. If you're trying to do two meals a day, you're fasting for a long period of time in between those meals. You're getting into deep autophagy. That's what fasting does. It gets us into autophagy. Now, I actually had a study pulled up, which I thought might, hold on here, hold that thought, Tristan, don't lose it. Okay, no, I lost the study. Anyways, you're fasting for an extended period of time in between those meals. I don't know when you're timing those meals, but say you eat breakfast in the morning and you have your last meal in the evening. That's what I do a lot of the times. That first meal is going to have 60 grams of protein. A negligible and healthy and necessary insulin response will happen in, with that meal, along with a blood glucose rise from glucagon. This is normal. This is healthy. This is required. Hold on. Hey, Ariana. You're going to do it? Do it outside. Okay? Yeah. Outside. Yeah. Thank you. It's healthy. It's normal. It's required. It needs to happen. Nothing wrong with it. Um, there's a long period of time where you're getting into autophagy when you're digesting, when you're not eating food in between those. So that negligible rise in insulin, where if you were to test your blood ketones before and after the meal, you would see a slight drop in those blood ketones. Oh goodness. Oh goodness. No. But what does that mean? All that means is you got less ketones in your blood, right? That doesn't mean you're failing your diet. That doesn't mean that you're not going to lose body fat because there's no direct correlation between higher blood ketone levels and fat loss, even and especially relevant, is this piece of data, even in people who are doing a ketogenic diet extended for an extended period of time. They did a study where they had people on a very low-carb ketogenic diet. In the beginning, their blood ketones were something around 1 or 1.1. After about five months, they're on the same diet. They're still losing body fat. They're still successful. They're still... They've been doing it for several months. Their blood ketones dropped to about 0.5 on average. That's just borderline ketosis. That's like the lowest that you could be to be technically in ketosis. But the relevance of that is completely made up in your own imagination. Unless you're treating a serious disease or epileptic and trying to avoid having epileptic seizures. Either way. You can drive it outside. Okay, so there's the answer. I'm not sure if that's the answer you were looking for. Might have taken that in a different direction than you were expecting. But I really hope that helps, and I hope that clears things up. If your goal is fat loss, if your goal is not high ketones all the time. This, go, this is for both of the questions that I've answered so far. Right? Mike Mo Lawasani says, hi from downtown San Francisco. What's up? Mike Mo Lawasani. My sister is in San Francisco. Stu Brew claims it's vodka in the cup. Stu Brew. I right, got people in Miami. We got all these people. Keith Williams, what's up, man? Bong Flash is back. One of my favorite names for a viewer. Bong Flash. All right. Brian Street, what's up, man? Loads of questions. Okay, here we go. If you don't have a gallbladder, do you need to take ox bile salts, even if I'm not having issues? That's funny. I, you know, all right, first of all, I'm not a doctor. Consult your doctor for this kind of advice. Uh, I'm not sanctioned by the medical priesthood 
I don't have a special title that allows me to give that kind of advice, right? But it's kind of, I don't know, it's a, a funny thing because I've had several people tell me they've got no gallbladder and that they've been doing keto for years, some of them, without taking any bile salts or anything like that. So, hey, I don't have the answer to that, but I will tell you that people have told me what you're hinting at, um, your experience, you're experiencing. <laughs> so, yeah. Six Retro says, I work three nights and then I'm off for three days and try to eat about 9 a.m. and 9 p.m., even when off work. Is that a good approach? If Is that a good approach? No, man. I'm, all right, first of all, so you're talking about circadian rhythm and meal timing. I titled this talk circadian rhythms and something to do with circadian rhythms and meal timing. And I've got loads of interesting stuff kind of in the back of my mind and a bunch of studies that I'd pulled up that I was, uh, you know, just looking at that kind of line up with what I've been saying for a long time. Meal timing is important. And for intermittent fasting and meal timing, a lot of these fitness gurus and, um, you know, the, the repeaters, the parrots on the internet, a lot of the stuff, I mean, it's about fads, right? It's about clicks, you know, Brandon Carter, slinging keto stuff now, right? Like you pull up like my, my uh, the, the Primal Edge Health Facebook page. And uh, in the little feed that it gives you like the, the ad suggestions. And there's this dude who's like a, you know, another like a YouTube fitness uh, guy, like big channel. And it's, it's this totally like packaged, funny commercial image of him with a Photoshop shirt that says something like keto shred or something like that. And, uh, you know, I mean, it's, it's a fat. Right, that's what I'm getting at. It's like there's there's so much energy going into it, and people just repeat stuff. Like people get into it because they know it's a fad, they want to ride the wave. They don't have the time to really, they don't take the time to really educate themselves, or they might know most people care to. Right? It's about hitting those clicks. It's about building the audience. It's about cashing in. So a lot of people repeat the same crap, and a lot of the same crap doesn't necessarily flesh out to be as true as they make it out to be. So there's a lot of studies showing the benefits of fasting for autophagy, for reducing caloric intake without having to think about it too much. Um, and just to get the benefits that you get the inflammation, the anti-inflammatory effects, the activation of certain genes that can be really beneficial for fighting things like cancer, for clearing out old dead tissues, for the function of the immune system, there's studies on fasting and on intermittent fasting. But there's also a lot of studies on meal timing, on meal frequency and stuff like that in the general population and other specific populations that lead us, that enable us to make a lot of calls about what the optimal meal timing is for fat loss, for circadian rhythms, for health, and for sleep, right? When I talk about circadian rhythm, I'm talking about light, dark cycles, being yoked to the cycles of day and night in our environment, proper sleep, proper rest, the activation of hormones at the right time. The body functions using, I mean, <laughs> the, body, the body has a rhythm that needs to function in sync with the environment, right? It's like music. And to make that harmonious, to make it sound right, to make it click in, to make things happen at the right time, we've got to understand and look at our own nature and look at the cycles of life around us, right? So eating at night, for the most part across the board, eating late at night sets us up for difficulty losing body fat, for increased inflammation, for poor sleep, and for all kinds of issues. Obviously, working nights, like you said, does the same thing. Very, very bad for you. It's something that, you know, that obviously you're trying to offset using healthy diet and lifestyle. And to a certain extent, you can kind of patch up those energetic leaks. But as long as you're working nights, you're always going to be dealing with a suboptimal environment for thriving, for pushing energy through the body and having it be healthy and run, you know, properly, for having the machine run right. Um, so, talking about meal timing, right? Here's a study, sciencedaily.com. This is from 2017. It was published June 2nd. Timing meals later at night can cause weight gain and impair fat metabolism. So, it's a study. All right, now, don't fall for the trick also 
of the appealing to authority, right? The bowing down because some study says, or because somebody claims that a study says, or somebody claims that scientists believe something that doesn't make it truth, right? Science is a process of exploration of testing hypotheses and of explaining natural phenomenon using a linguistic framework that's agreed upon um, and all that. So science is not the word of the gods. When science says something, there's no like monolithic entity called science, right? But the fairy tale version that people like to give, people who want to be perceived as right, like to give is that they're speaking on the behalf of science, right? Look, I'm not speaking on behalf of science. I'm just showing some studies that point to what I've been talking about for a long time. I find that there's a lot of evidence for, obviously, the circadian rhythm is crucial to all life. A messed up circadian rhythm has been shown to lead to the development of cancers, the increase, increases in inflammation, depression, all these things, these negative things that nobody wants to deal with, all are yoked to and tied to circadian biology. Um, so here's a study saying that timing meals later at night can cause weight gain and impair fat metabolism. I'll just read a few pieces from here. Part of the extract says, findings provide first experimental evidence of prolonged delayed eating versus daytime eating, showing that delayed eating can also raise insulin, fasting glucose, cholesterol, and triglyceride levels. All right, so I don't necessarily agree with the fact that cholesterol is bad, right? Obviously, we talked about this before, but look at this. There's a study showing that eating late at night, timing meals late at night, is giving these negative results in biomarker, biomarkers across the board in the study. Fascinating, very interesting. Look into this. So actually, if you, this isn't the entire study. Let's see. Where's the link to the study? Anyways, do your own research. Look into it. But very, very interesting. Something else. Consuming more of, here's another study, you find this on PubMed, this is from 2014. Consuming more of daily caloric intake at dinner predisposes to obesity, a six-year population-based prospective cohort study. So 1,245 non-obese, non-diabetic middle-aged adults from a population-based cohort underwent a three-day food record questionnaire at enrollment, anthropometric values, blood pressure, blood metabolic variables, and estimated liver fat were measured at baseline and a six-year follow-up. All right, not a perfect study by any means. Already an unhealthy, no, wait, I'm sorry, non-obese, non-diabetic, middle-aged adults. Okay, I, I retract that. Slightly better than I thought it was when I first read that and obviously wasn't tuned in enough to, to catch that. Okay, non-obese, non-diabetic adults, very interesting, not so bad. Divided up into turtiles of percent daily caloric intake at dinner a significant increase in the incidence rate of obesity, metabolic syndrome, and estimated non-alcoholic fatty liver disease was observed from lower to higher tertile. Okay, that's pretty interesting. That, I mean, as far as the study design, I don't know. It's not perfect, but this is very, very interesting, and I definitely have seen this play out in the real world too. Shift workers, people who eat late at night, people who party a lot. I mean, these all, all these behaviors result in Disrupted circadian rhythm, increased inflammation, more things like fatty liver disease, and not only poor eating habits, kind of, you know, because that comes along with the lifestyle, right? But, like, it straight up seems like people tend to gain more fat, and they're in their hormones, the way that their hormones are timed, are creating a problem that's kind of exacerbating the fat gain. So... <laughs> Thank you for the question. Let's pull this screen back up here. Where'd it go? Where did I find you? There you go. Thank you for the question. What was your question? Eating 9 a.m., 9 p.m. Intermittent fasting, very, very popular. Most people, when they do intermittent fasting, they say, skip breakfast, wait as long as you can for breakfast. When you look at the studies and how this actually fleshes out in the real world, People who skip breakfast, who don't eat in the morning, who eat later in the day, tend to have poor blood sugar control and worse biomarkers overall. Um, simply eating earlier in the day, skewing those calories to the daylight hours. And at night, 
when we're meant to relax, when our body's in autophagy, when we're not trying to put a bunch of energy into digesting, when your body wants to chill out, relax, regenerate, nighttime. We don't need to be putting lots of fuel into it. Okay. Sarah. What's up, Sarah? What's up, Tanya? Let's see. GDBUB says, I wonder where you live. <laughs> uh, we live in Ecuador. We live in the Andes of Ecuador, in a little town in the south of Ecuador called Vilcabamba. Misak, what's up? Misak says, lost five kilos in a month thanks to your coaching session. Looking on losing more weight and better mental clarity. Misak, you're doing great, man. Yeah, I'm glad you're tuning in. What time is it there, though? Isn't it like nine? Shouldn't you be in bed? <laughs> oh, man. Hey, I uh, hope everything's going well this week. I know you got a lot of things going on with family and stuff. But, uh, yeah, I hope you're well, man. You're doing great. Five kilos in a month is ridiculous, right? <laughs> That's incredible. You just keep moving forward. You have a foundation. The foundation is there. You keep those habits. You keep building on it, expanding it. Your palate changed. And you're learning how to prepare nutrient-dense foods for yourself. You're learning what ingredients to include, what makes you feel good, when meal timing for you will be optimal. And you know, you just keep refining it. You keep enjoying it. Enjoy the process. Don't, don't look so far forward to some definite goal. It's not about the goal. It's about being, right? I mean, you get to a goal and then there you are, right? It's about a way of life, not setting goals. I'm talking in generalities here too. I'm not talking about it's about a way of life of keto. I could care less like what you eat, right? Um, <laughs> there's many different healthy ways to eat where you can lose body fat and maintain a great body and physique and be healthy, happy, and vibrant. It's not all just about keto. But I'm talking in general. If we just are setting goals and we're just concerned with like these illusory goals of, I want to be that. I want to be this. Like, I want to be a firefighter. You know, like you're a little kid, you, you're growing up. You're like, what do you want to do when you grow up? I want to be a firefighter. Well, then you get older, you start to realize maybe that wasn't for me. Maybe this, you know, you, you change, right? So setting a goal and then forming ourselves and molding our life in accordance with this false idol that is a goal can be just a huge trap and keep us running in circles and chasing our own tail, right? Like, oh, goal, like I wanna have a successful business. Then you like give all you got, you build this successful business and you still feel empty inside, right? It's not about the goal, it's about a life of meaning, worth living. And then the goals add to and expand and build upon that. That's what's important to me. Maybe there's plenty of other ways to go about it. Sure, maybe empty. Empty goals is the way to go for some people, but not for me. <laughs> All right, Shiva Music says, what kind of diet would you recommend for vegans? Since a ketogenic diet would be hard to maintain. Thanks, and greetings from Germany. Um, Shiva Music, I would recommend a diet, like a human diet. Um, vegans are eating a diet, you know, meant for animals that are not omnivores. Uh, so a human diet consists of significant amounts of animal products, of animal foods. Every single human culture and society in the history of anthropology, archaeology, and mankind has used animal products. Only now, when we have this degenerated society with a destroyed, completely, <laughs> um, completely ridiculous education system, um, a media a superficial media-based culture that leaves lots of people wanting substance that they're not getting from their environment, from their immediate culture. And a lot of times, unfortunately, nowadays from the family, which has kind of been broken up in a lot of regards. Um, only in this society do people start gravitating for, towards like these ridiculous, you know, things like veganism and these pie in the sky, rock candy, mountain ideals the, you know, that are based on nothing. Like there's no historical precedent for veganism. There's no health precedent for veganism. 
Um, so yeah, I mean, if you're, I suggest it, rather than doing a vegan diet that they eat a human diet, which uses animal products, which celebrates the, the circle of life, whatever you want to call it, the entire food chain, right? We can't live on, we can't live on tofu and forgetting even like a raw vegan diet. Like I've done a vegan diet. I'm not going to sit here and like pretend like I'm like this converted vegan, right? I was never a part of the veganer than thou, like we're going to change the world. I never bought into that because it's completely obvious to anybody with logic that a vegan diet is not going to solve the ills of humanity. Um, so I never was in it for those reasons. At one point I thought it would be healthier. I soon realized that I was foolish at the time. Um, but you know, I mean, I know, I know, I have not, I've got friends who are vegans, long-term vegans and they're fine. They're alive. They're happy. But I mean, this is my program, right? This is what I'm saying. That's what I'm running on. I've done it. I don't think it works. What, you know what I've noticed? All right. So living in a community, right? In a living in a city or a town rather than live in a city, living in a town where there are a lot of people here who have done vegan diets, former vegans, there's a big population of expats from the U S especially and Europe, especially in Australia, um, all over a lot of expats all over South America. And if you look at a lot of the individuals who tend to be in certain areas, you can find pockets where there's a lot of vegans, current and former. Within these populations, you will notice a very, this is overt, it sucks, it's shitty to look at and notice, but you do notice a higher incidence, a far higher incidence of dental decay among their children. And this lines up perfectly with Weston A. Price's work, uh, his book, Nutrition and Physical Degeneration, when he went and visited other cultures and he found that all of them included fatty cuts of meat. All of them included things like organ meats and all of them were unrefined, not processed diets. None of them vegan, none of them even vegetarian, right? So he went to all these different cultures and studied their palates. They all have perfect palates, their teeth, their jaw, their nasal cavities are open. They can breathe well, but you see loads of degeneration once Western foods, once, you know, wheat, corn, soy, processed junk foods, it's added to the diet, refined sugar. Once these things get added to the diet, his observation and theory was that they are causing degeneration. Um, very interesting, but, and sad to see it play out in the real world where, you know, I live in, a, in an area where there's a high, there's a lot of people who at one point were vegan because they thought it was healthy. Many of them are not vegan anymore after having health issues with it, but seeing the incidence of dental caries and decay in the kids' teeth, especially like the ones that stick with the vegan thing, it's sad. It's alarming. It's really sad to see. All right. Anyways, let's move on. Brian Street says, Tristan, feeling much of the same. I'm changing my life and my lifestyle. I'm overweight. I lost 10 pounds almost immediately. Not much for a week or so now, but oh my God, do I feel so much better. My clothes are fitting better. It's strange that the scale isn't moving. There you go, Brian. The scale is not the only measure of progress. You're doing fantastic, man. Keep it up. And thanks for enjoying the show. Thanks for joining the channel. Okay. <clears throat> Keith Williams says, Tristan, what's up, man? Coming at you from Houston. I'm watching you over Joe Rogan right now. Wise decision, my friend. Down 76 pounds since January. Thanks, Theater Men Fasting and Keto. Keep on keeping on, and maybe. <laughs> man, he corrected. Cool, man. Right on. Um, Keith Williams, you made a wise decision watching me over Joe Rogan. Uh, no, I'm just kidding, man. Nothing against Joe Rogan. Let's see. We got Austria. Bong Flash is in Austria. <laughs> okay. Carrie S. What's up, Carrie S.? Sarah Majeur, what's up? Bong Flash asks, do you still upload your live hangouts as podcasts? Occasionally, I think Jessica does do that for us. Right now, I, I don't do it. Um, 
I don't know how many people listen to it as a podcast. I've never even looked at like the numbers or even bothered making proper descriptions to put it up as a podcast. You know, I mean, it's, I don't know. I've spent, we've spent our time elsewhere. We're not, we're not as ambitious of, uh, I don't know. We get sick of all the marketers and stuff. And we just like to, we make content, we communicate with our audience, we connect with you guys and get it out there. So I don't know, maybe more podcast stuff. I'll ask Jessica to look at the numbers and see if it's worth it. See if people are downloading it as a podcast and we'll keep doing it if it helps. Sounds like you want it as a podcast. So thanks for, thanks for your input there. Can it be extremo says, do you need to increase protein when weight training? Can you give advice to maintain performance while on a ketogenic diet? Can can be extremo says you need to increase protein when weight training. You can, and it might help you with, with your results, right? You need protein to rebuild muscle. Do you need to increase protein in your case? I don't know, because if you're already eating enough protein, do you need to increase it? No, but if you're not eating enough, then you do need to, but I've said this many times, a nice safe estimate for those weight training who want to maximize, uh, the efficiency of their protein and get sufficient protein and make sure they're not losing muscle. Uh, 0.8 grams per lean pound of body mass. 0.8 grams per pound of lean body mass is a nice safe spot for protein for most people across the board. Not too much, not too little. Um, all right. Harry S says, Mike Mutzel, High Intensity Health has a lot of great in interviews and information. Yeah, he came on here um before he's one of my favorite channels i mean favorite channels for keto i don't i don't know i don't really i don't watch other keto channels it might sound surprising but you know i mean i talk about keto all the time i like to talk to you know i talk to a lot of experts do my own podcast talk to people like mike mutzel um i love talking to people like dominic diagostino you know, networking with people like Luis Villasenor from Keto Gains, Tyler Cartwright from Keto Gains. There's other people that run very awesome websites like, you know, Keto Gains guys. Those guys are great. Um, shoot, plenty of other people. But um, other channels on YouTube, I don't really pay much attention to. Sorry. Ms. Bombiday says, wow. She says this in all capital. <laughs> the Ketogenic Edge Cookbook, a training manual, is awesome. You all should buy it. All right. Well, obviously, I agree with you because I've got my name on that product, right? <laughs> but it's not even like it's a product to us. I mean, this was a labor of love for Jessica and I. We spent over a year and a half putting this book together. Um, and it's, you know, it's not just we threw a bunch of recipes in there and like the standard stuff. No, our intention was to actually transmit to you guys as much valuable knowledge as we possibly could within the confines of the medium of the ebook, right? So we created a training manual and a cookbook in one. It basically trains you how to master your keto kitchen, how to use, how to make nutrient dense, low carb foods. And it's not even like you just, this is just limited to keto, right? We also made a specific point in a lot of the recipes and most of the recipes to give you suggestions on how you can modify them for people who aren't even on a keto diet, right? Our daughter's not on a ketogenic diet. Our son who's nine months old is not going to eat a ketogenic diet. They will eat healthy fats. We'll feed them the same delicious keto friendly foods, but they're going to have more carbohydrates. They're growing kids, right? I prefer to be on keto most of the year, but that doesn't mean it's right for everybody. So we wanted to make this book to where, you know, there's a lot of moms out there, dads out there who are preparing food for an entire family. And the whole thing is family friendly, right? That's what's so awesome about it too. Um, also, there's macros for every single meal. And all the macros are fat loss friendly. So the Ketogenic Edge Cookbook that Ms. Bombiday so kindly is recommending and emphatically recommending is available on the website, primaledgehealth.com. Um, and that reminds me too, Jessica, Jessica forwarded this, is, forwarded this email to me in Skype. Um, and I want to read it right now because it's actually, I don't do this too often. I actually never do this because I, all right, I don't want to go and get into it. But here's an email from a viewer, viewers like you guys who got the cookbook, was supporting the channel, digs the work we do, finds it valuable. And 
seems like seems like they were actually surprised. Like they thought maybe it was just going to be like a whatever cookbook. Um, like I said, it's a training manual. So here's what this individual says. I bought this book just to support the site and YouTube channel really. Something I use a lot and so far it's been free. So I felt about time to give something back. First was a keto bread. I've been looking for some kind of low carb, easy to make keto bread for ages and I found it. Great with all sorts. I usually make mine pancake style and use them as wraps for whatever I want to in them. Next was beef broth. We did far too much and struggled to find a place to store all this goodness. First batch went into the beef stew and wow, just fantastic. Prawn what recipe went, went down well. The cauliflower rice is superior to the cauliflower mash we've been used to. The coconut curry we had tonight was verging on the best curry we have tasted in 30 years of eating curries seriously. Although we substituted the coconut milk for, head, for whipping cream. Uh, here's a uh, little tip, use half and half because both coconut milk and heavy cream add an incredible flavor and texture and together they're awesome. This turned out to be just fantastic. Haven't mastered the mayonnaise, but we will eventually. And still so much left to try out. Can't see ourselves ever going back to the low fat, high carb diet we thought was good for our health. Books like this just confirm this. Looking forward to the baking book. Thanks, guys. All right. Do you remember what the what that person's name was, babe? Kevin. Kevin. Thank you, Kevin. Thanks for watching. Thanks for supporting the channel. And thanks for actually taking so much time to write that beautiful review and put it up on our page. I mean, you you obviously were so hyped that you went to our website again, filled out. I mean, you, thank you. Thank you for taking the time to do that. We appreciate it. Um, and it's feedback like this that makes us so excited to keep doing this, to put out more stuff. And uh, to get this next book edited and out there to you guys. So thanks for watching. Kevin. All right. Bong Flash says, please tell your wife to upload the live Hangouts as podcasts. I listen to them when I drive to work or go for a walk. Tell them I just uploaded like five. She just did like five, but she's going to do more. David Meyerless, what's up, man? He says, love your channel as always. I have a question. When I increase protein upwards past 50, 150 grams and up, I feel bloated. When I bring protein down to 120 to 140, I feel normal, no problems. David, that is a statement, my friend. Not a question. But um, I guess you're, you're just asking me, like, what the heck's up with that? Well, it sounds to me like pushing your protein past 150 is making you bloated. It also sounds to me like when you bring protein down from, to like 120 to 140, you feel no pro normal, like no problems. I would say your optimal protein range would be that range that you feel normal in with no problems rather than the one that gives you bloating. That's just me. I'm just a crazy person in the middle of Ecuador on YouTube. So, <laughs> um, yeah, man, look, if you're getting bloated, if you're feeling crappy, if you're getting inflamed from the things that you're doing, then something's off, right? Bloating, not a good thing. So you obviously don't need that much protein. Stick where you're sticking. I mean, stay in that nice zone where you feel healthy, vibrant, energetic, and good. And you'll be all right, man. Thank you, David. All right, let's see. All right, so can it be extreme though? The other part of your question earlier, can you give advice to maintain performance while on a ketogenic diet? Performance is going to come down to adaptation. You need to give yourself some time to adapt so that your body is used to this new metabolic pathway. Your performance will return. So don't train too crazy in the beginning when you're adapting. Also, electrolytes are crucial. Make sure you're getting enough sodium, magnesium, and potassium. Crucial, 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 crucial. Number one thing, electrolytes. Your performance is dropping. If you're lightheaded, got a headache, sodium is the easiest one. Get more sodium in. Eat potassium-rich foods like spinach, uh, avocado. Also, salmon's got a good amount of potassium. Um, and I think most people can probably benefit from some sort of a supplementation with magnesium. I usually recommend magnesium glycinate because it's used by muscles and it's not a laxative like many forms of magnesium. Okay. 
Merch Studio says, did you grow up in the States with a traditional diet? Yeah, I mean, I, I was born 1987, so grew up in California um, eating the, the stuff that was available in the supermarkets, right? Then you go to Ralph's, you harass your parents to get you the big box of, what's it called, of um, Lucky Charms, um, you know, Costco muffins, just, you know, mass-produced, hyper-palatable nutrient deficient junk food is kind of the standard American diet. I grew up eating it all. Grew up with allergies, with asthma, low energy, fatigue, you know, standard issues that most people deal with, with the degenerated diet that we live, uh, that we're living with um, in the environment that unfortunately we've not been stewarding properly. We've been, you know, pooping in the nest. Then pooping where we eat, folks. Um, so yeah, grew up in the U.S. eating the traditional diet. Nice, pudgy little boy, pudgy pale little boy. <laughs> Brad says, just found your channel. Looking to start keto at 56 years old. Looking for simple recipes and beginner help. Just found the channel. Wow, man, do you just, do you just find this live? Like as I'm talking to you, it's pretty funny. Uh, Brad. Check out PrimalEdgeHealth.com if you want simple recipes and beginner help. Check out all the videos I've ever done for simple recipes and video uh, and beginner help. If you just search recipe on this channel, you'll find several really good recipes. Several of them come from the Ketogenic Edge Cookbook, a training manual for low-carb, ketogenic, and paleo cuisine. I nail the title every time now. It's great. <laughs> um, that's our book. That's available exclusively at PrimalEdgeHealth.com. And the title is not just like some cutesy marketing copy crap. We actually spent a load of time trying to make this the most efficient training manual for prospective keto files so that you can uh, actually kill it in your keto kitchen, right? Like you got to feel comfortable in your kitchen preparing nutrient dense foods that are in accordance with this dietary path that you're about to take. Um, so yeah, check out the Ketogenic Edge cookbook. I mean, that's like the one stop that I would say you can go to for beginner help that will be a huge shortcut to you in general. And we've got loads of information on this channel that we put out for free and loads of recipes for free on the website too, man, in case you're not, not you know, trying to sell you on this right away. But um, you know, if you do find this stuff helpful and you enjoy the recipes that you see on the website, check out the cookbook and you will expand your scope and your power and your prowess in your kitchen and kind of empower yourself to be able to, to do that long-term, right? If you're going for fat loss, long-term success depends on your ability to create habits that are sustainable and enjoyable. That includes food prep, right? Huge hurdle for a lot of people. Fast acting venom says, well, I started keto four or five weeks ago and it was about 185. Now I'm 165. Kind of shocked me a little. I got shredded abs now, but I didn't expect to lose that much weight. Fast acting venom. There you go. So let me just reiterate something I talked about in the beginning. A ketogenic diet, while for many people, can be completely incredible, can be like, I don't know, can seem miraculous to some. It makes it easy not to eat so much. You're trying to lose weight and your hunger drops and you're able to maintain a state of low hunger so that you just eat less all the time, then you're going to be successful. And keto doesn't make it so that calories don't count. Keto doesn't make it so that you can eat as much keto food as you want and still lose weight. What keto does is it torches your hunger and makes it less likely that you're going to eat more and it helps you to change your habits. You're giving yourself nutrient-dense foods, calorie-dense foods. Most keto foods are not huge and bulky, right? So your stomach gets used to being smaller. They're not expanding and bloating so much with all the meals. That's a plus. Faster. You're getting sufficient protein to maintain lean muscle mass, to maintain stable blood glucose levels because protein is very important for that. Don't let people make you afraid of protein if you're doing keto, right? You're getting sufficient protein to support your lean muscle mass. You're not wasting away, catabolizing yourself. You're getting sufficient fats for energy. And if you're doing it for fat loss, the deficit gets created through that fat, right? What keto does, it makes it really, really easy for you not to eat a bunch. The protein satisfies. The vegetables give you the micronutrients and satiety as well through the fiber. 
It's a very, very supportive diet for long-term fat loss, but that doesn't mean you can eat as much as you want, that you can eat whatever you want, just eat keto foods and you'll be good and you'll lose body fat. Fast acting venom who just commented four to five weeks ago, started keto has dropped 20 pounds. That's awesome. This doesn't mean, and it's been effortless for him, right? Him or her, fast acting venom. I assume that's a dude's name, right? Come on. <laughs> um, it's, it's, it's been effortless. Hasn't had to try. Just lost 20 pounds. Wasn't you expecting to? Suddenly he's got abs. Feeling great. Just because this person experiences this doesn't mean that you're not going to have to dial in your diet and make sure to track your macronutrients and make sure you're not overeating. It doesn't mean you're not going to have to limit certain trigger foods. Like if you eat peanut butter one bite, you've got to finish the whole jar, right? It doesn't mean that you're going to like not going to have to deal with your relationship with food. It's just one example of an individual who was able to use this tool, this powerful tool for fat loss and be successful long-term in a short term, rather, right? 20 pounds in, in over a month, a little over a month. Um, so expect good things. Don't expect miracles and realize that it's not the same for everybody and that energy balance matters. I think that's a big takeaway from this podcast and many of the other episodes. People seem to think that eating more fat will make you lose more fat. Eating more fat can put you in ketosis and make you less hungry because you're eating fat. Your leptin levels are high. You're eating calories, right? You're eating food. But when you're in ketosis, and your hunger starts to drop, eating more fat, it's not going to make you burn more body fat. In fact, you've got to actually dial back the fats a little bit from the diet to burn the fat from your body. All right. The Deca says, how do you feel about eating once daily, fasting 22 hours with or without keto? I think it's context, man. I mean, look, for me, sometimes that's what I do for me every once in a while, right? But not consistently long-term. It's just the body needs cyclical periods of anabolism and catabolism. It's all about circadian rhythms. These cycles of anabolism and catabolism would always historically also be yoked to environmental circumstances like seasonal change, Right. So you have these anabolic seasons where there's loads of carbohydrates available. When you put on weight, you have catabolic seasons when there's not loads of carbohydrate available or lot, not lots of food available when you burn off that body fat. Um, it's, about sick, it's about cycles. It's about rhythm. It's about balance. So across the board, 22 hours, one meal a day, forever, for everybody. No, right? In certain circumstances can be applied. Certain circumstances, short term, and probably be great. But you keep doing anything like that long term, you can't just fast forever, right? Fasting is not a long term solution. The body ends up getting hungry, wanting to bounce back. Intermittent fasting in and of itself doesn't make you lose body fat. And in a lot of situations, it doesn't even make people eat less because they just end up stuffing themselves when they get to that one meal, right? So it's all about context, it's all about what works for you. And it's about optimizing it within your context. That context has to include stress levels that come from other places like possibly disrupted circadian rhythm. If you're waiting all day and then eating at nine o'clock, just like that study's shown, you're creating a hormonal situation that's not that beneficial for fat loss and that can induce more um, inflammation and have negative effects on body composition. So context, context, context. All right. Bong Clash says, do you think our ancestors really have been eating less protein than fat in grams? I wonder if the animal, no, I don't think they were by choice. Most of them. Um, I wonder if the animals were really so fat when we were hunter gatherers. Uh, well, who, who said that our ancestors were eating more fat than protein? Um, proteins and fats come coupled in nature. So they're going to come together and different environments provide different yields of different types of fats and of different types of carbohydrates. So if you're talking about Inuit, that'll be a very different population than if you're talking about even, you know, people with not that 
dissimilar of an environment like the Norwegians, right? Like Scandinavian populations. Andean South American populations, very, very different dietary composition than, you know, like North, like North, North America. Very, very different. So, yeah, I mean, no, I don't think our ancestors were necessarily eating more fat than protein. Who said that? Bong Clash says, perhaps our ancestors have also taken more protein than is recommended today for a keto diet. Sure, but I mean, what's the relevance of this too, right? And so we can't just appeal to ancestry and pretend that what they were doing was right, right? There's the assumption that what our ancestors did was optimal. And I'm not trying to break that down. I'm not saying that like, I think there, there are certain things about how we would have lived in the past that are far better than what we're doing today, right? But we can't make an assumption across the board, past equals good, present equals bad, right? We also can't make the assumption that all um, temporal progress is also existential progress, right? Like just because society progresses in a certain way doesn't mean that it's moving towards something better, right? We have this like, you know, the social Darwinist theory of like, you know, survival, the fittest, these things, I don't, these are, these are faulty, the faulty frameworks of analysis. Is what I'm getting. I don't want to get too deep into this. Just talking to myself about someone to bounce these ideas with me. Um, all right. How many calories would you say breaks a fasting state? How many calories breaks the fasting state? Um, any calories break the fasting state, right? Look, if you're going to, like, why, why play that game? Oh, I'm fasting. Ah, but what if I just eat 10 calories every 30 minutes? And just have like this slow IV drip of 10 calories. My insulin will never rise. Like, what? Well, come on, let's not play these silly games. If you're going to fast, you're not eating. If you're eating, you're eating, right? We were, I was talking about cycles earlier. Anabolic and catabolic cycles, right? Fasting all the time, not conducive to long life. You have to grow sometimes, right? You can't just fast all the time. It can't be perpetual harsh winter. You need the spring. You can't be awake all the time. You need some sleep. You can't sleep all the time. You need light. <laughs> it's about balance, guys. Balance, balance, balance. It's crucial. Um, how many calories break a fasting state? Any calories. If you're going to fast, you fast. If you're going to feast, you feast. Here's a question. This is a really good question. Is there a way to get rid of physiological insulin resistance induced by the keto diet? Is this even desirable? Better question. Is this proof of full fat adaptation or wrong application of keto? Insulin resistance, physiological insulin resistance happens in a ketogenic state. When you're on a ketogenic diet, when you reduce carbohydrates, there are certain parts of the body that need some glucose, namely in the brain. Parts of the brain need that glucose. Jessica, is my phone in the car? Can you go to the car and grab it for me? I think Don was supposed to call. You need some glucose for your brain. Your body will partition that, namely the liver, will partition that and save it. And all of your other tissues will become insulin resistant because you don't need glucose in them. You need glucose in your brain. So this is a beneficial adaptation. This is required for proper ketosis. Physiological insulin resistance is desirable for ketosis. I think, <laughs> right? I mean, I don't know a way around it. I've never seen anything showing a way around it. Now, long term, you're going to become more insulin sensitive, but you become immediately peripheral insulin resistant. This is not a bad thing, right? Your insulin sensitivity will come back when you drop the fat intake and increase your carbohydrate intake. Fatty acids in and of themselves will create insulin resistance as well. Yes, fatty acids will create insulin resistance. So high fat plus high carb Insulin resistance, fat gain, weight gain, anabolic. Interesting. Long Flash says, my guess is that our body is designed to the circumstances of our ancestors and not the actual nutritional forms of Western culture. Fan yeah, exactly, man. Exactly. I see the lights like flashing for some reason. Um, yes. This is new, right? This is a new system. The new system, like the industrial waste diet that we're eating now, this is very new, right? 
The Industrial Revolution is a stone's throw behind us in history. Before this, people were making their own food. All food was organic until recently. A few generations ago, all food was organic. None of it was, was grown using toxic, toxic neonicotinoid chemicals, using glyphosate, an antibiotic that binds up minerals in the soil and destroys the soil, that makes insects' intestines explode, that increases the autism rates all around the areas where it's sprayed heavily. These things weren't a part of the diet. These are modern advances, right? Advances. Unfortunately, this advance is regressing our genetics, right? This advance making us die younger. This is not progress, right? Just because you call something progress, just because something happens after other things doesn't mean it's a, like a, the right direction to go. It's not always progress. Think about like dysfunctional families and dysfunctional people, right? It's like you see people and just because they move forward in time and they change, they evolve as a person doesn't mean that they're evolving towards something better. Some people become worse when they get older. Some people become you know, more caught up in their programs and their nonsense. Same with cultures. <laughs> Misty says, I'm a firm believer that intuitive eating and IF with keto comes naturally. I eat when my body tells me it needs food. ABD, if I'm not hungry for 20 to 24 hours, I don't eat. I think people stress too much. <laughs> if you and your body are ready to fast, it'll happen more naturally. Exactly. When you get sick, you naturally eat less. Right? When your stomach feels weird, you don't want to eat. Your body knows what to do. Now, the thing is, Misty, whereas you're tuned into your body, you're tuned into your health, you're using your body as a tool to get things done in other ways. And you've realized how you can keep it in a specific balance and you, how you can make it thrive through proper input, proper timing of things and stuff like that. Most other people are not where you're at though, Misty. I mean, you're kind of an advanced case, right? Like just because you and I can eat intuitively, no matter where we're at, we, can, we have habits that are ingrained. We've built those habits. A lot of people haven't built those habits. A lot of people, if they just listen to their body, will walk to their refrigerator and you know grab a beer sit in front of the tv and then 10 minutes later after they're finished with the beer they'll go get a pint of ben and jerry's walk back to their tv and they're listening to their body my body wants to be in front of the tv eating ben and jerry's right now i'm eating intuitively right like that's intuitive eating for most people we've got to train the intuition we have to train the mind we have to train the body we have to train the habits misty thank you for the comment I agree with you and you know what I'm saying, why I'm saying it. And uh, yeah, it's like not, not everyone's at the spot where you're at. Some people have to start from square one and start building healthy habits of food choices and understanding of what the body needs and understanding of how to get insufficient protein, how to get in micronutrients, how to enjoy eating vegetables, right? When, when not to eat, how to read those signals. When are we really hungry or when are we thirsty or bored or stressed or depressed and we just want to smother it with food? We have to navigate this and each individual has got to do it. We, it it's our responsibility to maintain this vessel, to maintain our health. It's our responsibility and it's our right. And that's what's beautiful. It is your right to treat your body as well or as crappy as you desire. Okay, we got people in Saskatchewan, Canada. What's up? We've got David W. What's up, man? David asks, how do you determine lean body weight as opposed to just body weight? Your lean body mass is your fat-free mass. Subtract the fat mass from your total mass. There's your lean body mass. Ruby says, make Jessica's coconut bread delicious. And that's Is that from the Ketogenic Guys Cookbook? Huh? Uh, someone from the website. So there's a free recipe right there from the website. Check out the coconut bread. And I'm pretty sure it's kind of a preview of a more in-depth 
basically tr- like another training manual on how to low carb bake. Um, and there's a lot of different recipe variations you can do with this bread, like adding things like uh, dried olives, botija, the Peruvian olives. They're so good in it. Remember that one you made? Olive? That was good. Uh, you could put roasted garlic in it. You can put goat cheese on the top and then bake it. Pull it out the oven halfway, put goat cheese on, put it back in the oven. Ooh, I dare you. <laughs> All right. Misty says you're 100% right. Yeah, that's all that matters, right? Is that I'm right. It's the internet. You're 100% right. It takes a while, but eventually we learn the body's language. We got to learn what's going on. We got to learn to interpret the messages. We got to learn to interpret um, the environmental message and needing more food or needing less food, right? Um, I think when we get ill, when we get like the flu or the cold or something, it's a really good time to learn about how our body reacts to food and what food does in our body, right? When you're in that depleted state after you have the flu or something and you're finally able to eat and digest again, you really get a feel at a primal level what's going on when you consume that food. And fasting does the same thing for people. But like when you're sick, you're kind of forced to fast. Um, And I think those are really important times to actually learning the messaging and learning how to communicate with the body and read what's going on. Phil in Portugal says, well, greetings from Portugal. I'm on keto plus 18-hour intermittent fasting. It was 118 kilograms at the start. I'm at 91 kilograms now, going for gladiator physique. <laughs> says, keto is love, keto is life. That's funny. Right on. Keto can be pretty rad, right? Hey, so you started 118. Now you're down 91, 17 kilos, 27 kilos down. That's fantastic. Congratulations. All right, Bong Flash says, I cut out sugar and switched to a whole foods diet some months ago. Sometimes I felt as if I got off some drugs. feel much cleaner now. Interesting, right? You stop putting the toxic waste products in your body. Your body and your mind start to function better and you feel better. Right. And it's not just a placebo effect, right? There's low level chronic inflammation that we get from consuming these PUFAs, these polyunsaturated fatty acids, these vegetable oils that are rancid. Um, There's omega six inflammatory oils, trans fats, um, you know, combined with low quality refined sugar crap. I mean, there's nothing wrong with glucose in and of itself, with sugar in and of itself. The problem is this crap refined diet, this toxic waste diet. And quite frankly, a lot of it's not even the food. A lot of it's what's added to the food. It's the additives. It's the preservatives. It's the toxic crap that's sprayed on it. Like you guys seen videos of them spraying the cucumbers with this plastic to make them shiny so they can sell it in the stores. This is what goes on because it's about perception, right? Marketing copy, you know, mass consumer culture, mass produced food, mass produced music, mass produced entertainment. It's about catchy, flashy, selly, right? So the supermarkets want super shiny cucumbers. And if you don't have a cucumber that's a certain shape, if it's too bent, if it's not shiny enough, you don't get to sell it in the supermarkets in the EU, in the EU and in the U S like this is pushing food producers to cut corners, right? So they're spraying them with like plastic sheen. This is real. You could, I forget what the video's title was. There was a lot of footage of some alarming practices that are real and they're happening worldwide due to this industrial waste diet that wants to standardize and make everything real pretty on the outside. But on the inside, it's full of crap, right? Like your Twinkies look all pretty. They look all pretty and clean but they're full of filth. Like they're just, it's this toxic crap, industrial waste products. It's like a freaking sponge you're eating, a sugary sponge. It tastes great though, right? So when we stop eating these mass produced, low quality, low nutrient density foods that are grown in crap soil that destroys the genetic heritage of the foods we eat, right? These corn products, soy products, wheat products, they're destroying our health. They're destroying the environment. 
to destroy the genetic heritage of our food and our own genetic heritage as our palates are being changed, our teeth, we're having more dental issues, weak bones, disrupted circadian rhythms, diabetes, neurological diseases, all of this, this lack of nutrition is exacerbating the problem. And all these toxic additives are just, I mean, it's awful, right? Glyphosate, look up glyphosate, the carcinogenic crap that's sprayed on food like it's candy, that's been bullied into this protected state by the USDA, the FDA, all these fake sham organizations. Anyways, when you switch from that toxic filth industrial crap diet, just like when you stop listening to pop music, and your mind starts working better, you're more emotionally stable, you stop listening to this filth, this perversion influence that's constantly influencing us, trying to influence us, to embrace this lower nature that we don't need to submit to, right? When you get rid of the, the sugar crap, not just like, not saying that all carbohydrates and sugar are bad, but when you get rid of these processed, refined, filled food, you start feeding yourself nutrient-dense foods. You start treating your body like a temple. You start treating your body like you want it to last, like you want it to be here and be as present as vibrant, as full of life, of possibility, of perception as you possibly can in this given moment, when you do that, your life completely changes. And it's not just placebo, right? A lot of it has to do with your intention though. Do you want more life? If you want more life, you will do what is required to be able to handle it and to be able to reclaim the energy leaks that you've been, you know, busting off into the world because we've all been given much more energy than we really use we all have a lot more energy at our disposal that gets wasted that gets leaked out constant nagging negative repetitive thoughts through the pop song repeating in your mind Katy perry mind control crap filth music playing repeat in your mind right you have energy leakages you know when we reclaim those energy leakages, you know, the inflammation from a crappy, low quality diet that we're using to try and dumb ourselves down so we don't have to deal with the responsibility of having the amount of energy that you have at your disposal right now, the amount of decision, the amount of energy, the ability to make decisions that will change the, the whole landscape of reality for you is right here, right now. That energy is there for us. We just get distracted. We just get dumped down from it. We just get in a state of reinforcing ignorance of this, right? So changing our diet, treating our body well, honoring the vessel, not treating it like crap, not, you know, being a nutritional nihilist and just, ah, whatever, as long as my body looks good. You know, when you get beyond that and you start wanting to live, you want to start wanting more, you'll do what it takes. And what's, what's the, the thing about keto for me, it's like, keto is not my life. He doesn't give me life. But it's one practice. It's a discipline that I have in my life. It's part of the toolbox of things I can do to make my life, to just make my body function better within this life that I have so that I can maximize my experience here. All right. Let's wrap this up, guys. This has been nice. Nice mellow hangout. Monday. It's Monday. Everyone's back at work. Monday's a super important day. Don't let Monday drag you down, make you feel like, oh, this sucks. You gotta get hyped on Monday, right? What are you gonna get done this week? What can you do right now to make your life, your situation better, to make this moment more enjoyable for the people around you, to make things smooth, flow more smoothly for everyone you come in contact with? What can we do right now? What can we do today to make it better, right? If that's our intention, if that's our focus, if that's the lens through which we're looking, we'll have an amazing day, an amazing week. And if we can maintain that longer and longer, we can have an amazing day.
you know? It'd be hard to maintain that, but it's really important. All right, everybody. Thanks for joining. You can find more at primaledgehealth.com. Um, check out the Ketogenic Edge Cookbook, available exclusively at primaledgehealth.com. And if you want to be notified beforehand when we do these live events so you can uh, put your comments, put your questions, Benjamin Scally, see you later, man. Bong Flash, Misty Case, M. Amo, Ruby Ruby, uh, Les, what's up? Look at all these awesome people. Ancient Queen, what's up, Ancient Queen? Mike Mo, goodbye, everybody. Thanks for watching. If you want to be notified before the next one so you can talk to me live, go to primaledgehealth.com and sign up for notifications in, is it the top bar or the bottom bar, Jessica? Anyways, go to primaledgehealth.com, sign up for the newsletter, and you'll be notified beforehand when we do these. We try to send out an email a few hours before to notify you so you can check it out live. Anyways, you guys have a good day. How can we make this experience, this moment, this day, the next interaction you have with somebody in your immediate presence, how can we make that as meaningful, as awesome, as helpful, and as good as possible? How can we do that? Focus on that. That's a better thing to look at on Monday rather than, ah, I gotta go to work. All right, everybody. See you next time. PrimalEdgeHealth.com. Peace.